Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello everyone, this is Seth with the World of Paleoanthropology, and today we have another wonderful guest. Let's give him a chance to introduce himself. Hi, my name is Jeff McKee, and I am a professor of anthropology at The Ohio State University. I have my uh, 25th anniversary of being at OSU um, on September 1st. So before that, I was a senior lecturer at the University of the Vibhadrajan uh, in South Africa. And that's where I got my start in paleoanthropology. Well, that, I, that definitely is an impressive track record. Um, so what got you into this? You say you started at WITS, but what made human origins so attractive to you? Well, uh, <laughs> It's just kind of been there all my life. Um, when I was a young boy, you know, I was fascinated by dinosaurs and by artifacts and all sorts of things. But when I was 13 years old, I watched a National Geographic special of the famous Louis Leakey at Old Divi Gorge. And Louis Leakey was walking down the side of Old Divi Gorge and the narrator said something like, with every step he takes, he descends another 6,000 years into man's past. And I was hooked. That was a 13 year old boy decided he was gonna be an anthropologist. <laughs> and so uh, I got my degrees um, at Miami University of Ohio. I was an anthropology major. Then I got my master's and PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. And then a year later, I got hired in the anatomy department at the University of the Vatershan Medical School. And uh, Philip Tobias wanted me to go out and excavate at Taiwan. That's what I did. Right. That is awesome. That is, um, that's definitely one of the more interesting specimen that we have the tong child and i think a lot of people aren't necessarily they kind of i know when i first started i got afrensis and africanus mixed up a lot so while we're talking about the tong child why don't you um since you were so involved with this tell us a little bit about what it is and why it's special Okay, well, um, hold on a second. I happen to have a cast right here. Awesome. Uh, and I call it the nexus of uh, African paleoanthropology because it was really the first specimen of uh, an early human predecessor to come from Africa. And so uh, Raymond Dart, had, had, uh, who was the professor of anatomy at the University of Vatershaw Medical School and the dean at the medical school, was given by a student some fossil baboons. And he said, well, you know, um, if any more of that comes out, then uh, please send it to me. And so a geologist named Robert Young went down to Taong and uh, picked up a bunch of fossils that the quarriers had found. And they were sitting on the desk of the quarry manager, you know, being used as paperweights and things like that. The Robert Young uh, took the paperweight and um, put a whole bunch of fossils in a box and sent it to Raymond Dart by train. And in uh, 1924, and Dart reached into that box and the first thing he pulled out was this. Wow. Now, now Dart 
as an anatomist, was an expert on the brain, fortunately. And he immediately recognized this as what we call an endocast of a brain, because the brain leaves impressions on the inside of the skull. And so, you know, skull had uh, filled up with sediment, and then they were quarrying for limestone, you know, with a blast of dynamite. Uh, this came out. The skull was left behind, but you see all sorts of features. The gyri and sulci of the brain, there's an artery uh, right here called the middle meningeal artery mm. that feeds the coverings of the brain. And so Dart was quite fascinated by this because it didn't look like the baboon skulls he had been sent. So he, he reached into the box of fossils that Robert Young had sent him and he saw a rock like this. And he noticed that it fit the endocast. And so as the legend goes, he <laughs> got out his wife's knitting needles, which were steel at the time. And in uh, 40 days and 40 nights, he revealed the face of the town child. How did he know it was a child? We don't know here. Here we go. That is so cool. Yeah, so um, we, 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 know, we know it's a child, a juvenile right. anyway, because um, these are the deciduous teeth, the, the baby teeth. And then the first permanent molar is coming in here. Yeah, it's not higher. And it's not quite into occlusion. In other words, the molars don't come together quite yet, but it's, it's coming in in this juvenile, probably died at about age four, maybe five. Mm -hmm. um, in humans, the first permanent molar comes in at age six. There's one difference there already. Uh, so, but the key thing was that when he started looking at this skull, he noticed that the foramen magnum, now the foramen magnum is the hole at the bottom at the base of the skull where the spinal cord meets the brain. He noticed that the magnum is fairly far forward. In a chimp or, or a quadruped, any quadruped for that matter, this spinal cord comes in back here. So he was able to deduce that the foramen magnum had moved forward because this creature stood upright. And so uh, in 1925, he published on Australopithecus africanus. Austral means southern. It was kind of a joke because uh, Dart was from Australia. <laughs> Pithecus means ape. And so it's, it's southern ape of Africa, Australopithecus africanus. But when he published it, he implied that it was one of our ancestors. And uh, that was quite controversial at the time. Everything about that was was wrong. It was from the wrong place. It um, was bipedal before it had a large brain. Uh, and they weren't convinced that Dart was a good enough anatomist to recognize a juvenile as a separate species. That, you know, this is probably a, a chimp or something like that. But eventually, um, with uh, the discovery of other fossils of Australopithecus africanus, like this one from Sturkfontein near Johannesburg, uh, the world became convinced. But that was the key because that, that was the reason I call it the nexus of African paleoanthropology is because that was the first fossil found. Um, and although Dart is credited with the uh, discovery, he discovered it in a box that was sent to him. Um, Dart himself actually didn't go out to Talon until 1948. Oh, wow. Then there was a uh, small uh, American team that came to visit. They stayed for about a year and they got down some of the fundamentals of the Talon site. Uh, but nothing else was done until um, 1987. I joined uh, 
University, working for Philip Tobias, uh, 1986. And by 1987, I had started working out at Tao and uh, worked there for seven field seasons, and those were magnificent. I've been telling people that, uh, um, you know, this is my 25th anniversary here at OSU, but those 10 years that I lived in South Africa um, shaped me more than the t subsequent 25 years, no doubt. I, I believe it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so speaking on what are your views on open access education versus say what some anthropologists do where they keep the specimens for their own study until they're ready to release it? Well, I think that people who discover a fossil have the right to, um, you know, have first go at publishing it and, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, once it's published, then it should be available to a qualified scientist. Um, in, let me see, I forget what year it was, I think it was 1931. Uh, Dark took the Taong child itself to London uh, to try to convince the scholars, the British scholars, that Australopithecus africanus was uh, a legitimate ancestor to humans. He didn't get very far um, in convincing them until later, but uh, that was kind of open access. He, he took a boat back to South Africa and left the skull itself, the original, with Grafton Elliot Smith, who was a famous anatomist, famous British anatomist. Mm -hmm. And so Smith was allowed to study it and other scholars in England or visitors to London were able to study it uh, directly. <laughs> now, the catch there is that um, Dart's first wife, uh, Dora Dart, was going to be responsible for bringing it back to South Africa. And um, she, she was staying back in London because she was finishing up some studies in nursing or, or whatever she was doing, some sort of medical field. And Grafton Elliott Smith gave her the skull back to take on the boat to South Africa. And she went back to her apartment and uh, was getting ready for bed and suddenly realized that she didn't have the package with her. So she had left it in a London taxi cab. So, so this, uh, this little guy was riding all over London <laughs> with nobody knowing that he was in the back of his cab. Called the police and they, they got it back. But I'm pretty sure that that's why Dora Dart was Dart's first wife. <laughs> <laughs> they, they divorced three years later. Wow. Um, so what, over the last, uh, let's say 20 years, what do you, what have you seen that has changed in the field? And do you think it's good? Or do you think there's things that need to be improved on? Oh, there's always room for improvement. Right. Um, paleoanthropology might seem like an old field, but it, it's actually a fairly recent field that um, Dart got going in 1925 when he published on the Talon Child. And then, you know, things started coming out from England and Asia and whatnot. So we're a very young field. Uh, but over the last 20 years, um, there have been lots of new species found which uh, my students hate that because, you know, I was teaching 20 years ago, there were, you know, a dozen fewer names for them to learn. Now, now they have to learn all sorts of new names. <laughs> so what, what we're seeing though, is uh, greater diversity in hominins. And I think that's a wonderful thing uh, that, you know, there are all these side branches. We knew 
long ago because of the fossils from swart crowns, where you had Homo erectus and Australopithecus robustus in the same deposits, that it wasn't just a straight line uh, to humans, that, that there were branches. Now we have all sorts of branches, almost too many, because we don't know who would be gas who, so to speak. Um, but there have been advances in dating, there's been advances in uh, chemistry, although we don't like to grind up teeth. Um, every now and then we can, and we can learn a lot from that. Uh, but, um, you know, the excavation techniques themselves are still fairly primitive. We're, we aren't doing things much differently than, than uh, Robert Room did at Sturkenthain when, when they got out uh, Mrs. Plez here. Um, there are some advances, uh, you know, because back then they used to use dynamite to get the fossils out. Yeah. And, and now we, hit, we have these slowly expanding, uh, I forget what they're called, but slowly expanding things. So rather than blast something out, you can put this material in a crack and slowly break off a block. Mm. But in you know in South Africa, it's it's not as easy as it is in East Africa. You know, in East Africa, you, you walk along the desert after it's been eroding away for a year, and you know, you trip over a bone and um, you take out your camel hair brush and oh looky, it's the Lucy skeleton, you know. But here in South Africa, we, we've got to there in South Africa, we got to get things out of solid rock. And there is no really good way to do that. There are a lot of different techniques that one can use depending on the situation, but there's really no good way to do that. Um, I recently saw an article, I don't remember the details, maybe you read it or heard about it, but that there is a new, um, extremely less destructive method of dating that they've recently discovered. Or I, I don't remember the details, but it was like a non-destructive way of getting the dates of something. Have you heard about that? Um, no, but dating in general is non-destructive you know, because you know, aren't actually dating the fossil. You're dating the, the settlement that the fossil was found in, and that's abundant. Right. Um, so I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, but uh, it might be a method of dating that applies directly to the fossils, but I, I haven't heard about that. Okay, okay. Um, so where do you think the field is headed in the next 10 years? Well, where is the field headed? In the next 10 years, well, I mean, the, the field has expanded quite a lot. You know, it used to be you just go out and you find a fossil and you describe it and that's it. But, you know, over the last uh, 30 years, the context of the fossil became as important as the fossil itself. And so, you know, the environmental reconstructions are more important. The, the, the dating itself is important um, to put things into a temporal context. I think we're just going to continue on that trajectory of, you know, finding more fossils, uh, filling out the the human lineage or pre-human lineage, I should say. But uh, just like evolution itself, you cannot really predict where a, a field is going. You know, you can't predict what we are going to evolve into, and you can't predict what a scientific field about evolution. It's going to evolve into because, because there are surprises along the way. All right. Now that's part of the beauty of it is the surprising nature of fossil discoveries, and uh, you know you don't find what you expect to find, but find something totally new. So I think that's just going to continue. Okay. Um. So. Where, when we're talking about, um, let's say, early Homo, we have, you know, this 
debate going on still where, you know, Lewis Leakey kind of got Homo habilis to fit in without, like, he kind of had to change the rules for the species, the um, genus. Where do you think the roots of Homo lay and have we gotten close to it yet? Well, that is an interesting question. Um, I, I do think that Homo habilis, and, and uh, I'm a lumper rather than a splitter, so I don't include Homo rudolfensis, just, which is why I often talk about early Homo. Um, where you divide the line between Australopithecus and Homo is fairly arbitrary, so people can argue that it's uh, Australopithecus habilis, but it, uh, it really doesn't matter. It's fairly arbitrary. But certainly, you know, somewhere around two and a half million years ago, uh, we started having a feature show up in the fossils. You know, it, Homo habilis was still a very small creature, just like Australopithecus. But its brain was starting to be lateralized. And that's, that's a key thing to becoming a member of the genus Homo. And it had the expansion of um, two areas of the brain that are involved with speech and language. So, and that's also when we start seeing a lot of stone tools. Um, the dates for stone tools are getting pushed back a little bit. Right. But uh, you know, I, I think the neurological capacity for language and stone tool technology, even though it's very simple stone tool technology, the old one tools, you know, it's just one rock bashed against another, and you know, then you got a flake to do some scavenging with. But that certainly was an important uh, step in human evolution. I don't think we are going to see any uh, dramatic changes to that view of early Homo. Very, very interesting, well explained. Now, speaking of very early hominins, where do you stand on, because I, I find this very interesting, and I, I'd like to believe he was bipedal, but where do you stand on Sahelanthropus chidensis? Do you think he was bipedal? Um, <laughs> that, that's a tough one. You know, that, that skull is a bit distorted. It's a beautiful yeah. specimen, but uh, um, it's a bit distorted. And Sahelanthropus has this, um, you know, flatter face, but I, I think that's a homoplasy. In other words, it's a bit of parallel evolution. You know, there's nothing else about Sahelanthropus that is, uh, you know, convincing about it being a biped or a hominin. But, but he, here's one thing that my, my, my colleagues often get wrong. That is, you know, the very first hominin just has to be separate from the lineage that led to chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. We didn't necessarily stand up right away. So you can have a hominin that's not a biped. Um, it took a while. And, and Artipithecus ramidus is, is good evidence that you know, standing up was a process because Artipithecus ramidus was a, a facultative biped rather than a habitual biped. So with Sahel Anthropus, you know, it might be one of our ancestors, maybe not. I think we need a larger sample. And that's true. Um, uh, lots of species. Right, right. What do you expect? So I know when we're talking about, um, you know, the fossil record, we have a big gap between three, kind of three and six million years ago. What do you think is in that period? Do you think it's going to be pretty like we can predict by what features existed prior and after of what they'd be? Or do you think there could be something that's just very different than what we've seen? There could be something very different. I, I don't think the gap between three and six is that big, but um, because of Artipithecus. Uh, but um, there certainly are other things going on evolutionarily in the hominin lineage at that time. But, you know, predicting what it's going to be is kind of impossible. Now, one of my heroes, Iron Shelf of uh, Thomas Huxley, oops, right here, um, 
he, he said, you know, when you're looking into the past, <clears throat> and you're looking for a common ancestor, a common ancestor need not be, you know, half of one and half of the other. It's going to be something totally unique. You know, people forget that chips continue to evolve as well, and we continue to evolve on different trajectories. So something I call Australopithecus isn't half chimp and half human. It's, it's Australopithecus-like. And so, you know, its ancestors are going to be pretty much uh, the same sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, what is your favorite thing as a professor to teach? My Not wrong. Favorite broad. thing to teach. <laughs> um, oh, I, I love teaching everything, you know. Uh, I think um, because of my years at uh, University of the Vatashan Medical School. I do enjoy teaching anatomy and particularly embryology because I see mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of embryological features that um, tie into our evolutionary past. And so I enjoy teaching embryology. I'm not sure my students do. They, they, they <laughs> want to get to the fossils and stuff. Um, I enjoy teaching uh, ecological things as well. You know, put, putting things into context, and a lot of my recent research has been on not on fossil stuff, but uh, contemporary extinctions and uh, threats of extinctions. We can tie in what we know from the fossil record into the present. So I like teaching that kind of stuff too. Very interesting. So when you I'm sorry, where did you say you're at at the moment? The pardon? I'm sorry, what university did you say you were at at the moment or school? Ohio State University. Ohio State. Okay, awesome. So at Ohio State, um, specifically, I know a lot of universities do specific field studies and work and summer camps and things like that. Is there anything at your university that you think is particularly special and influential that would attract anthropology students? Well, I must kind of field work. There are other people do work in East and um, uh, Clark Larson, who was our former uh, department chair, does a lot of bioarchaeology. So that's one of the biggest attractions for graduate students is, you know, we have uh, archaeological sites and human remains uh, here in the United States. So that's a lot easier to have than something out in South Africa or whatever. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Speaking of North America, I recently, I don't remember the exact context, but there's been a lot of ideas being thrown around lately of the first peopling of the Americas. Uh, for example, I live about two hours away from San Diego where there's this, um, site, this archaeological site where there's a mammoth, and they believe, there are some professors that believe there are signs of stone tool use. But this was 135,000 years ago. Hmm. So do you, are you more on the line of like the Bering Strait kind of 15,000 years ago, or how do you think the Americas got where we are today? I, I think we came in multiple waves, and uh, I think that shows up in the modern biology of uh, Native Americans. If you look at their genes, you, you can see there are sort of waves of gene flow on top of gene flow. And just yesterday, I saw an article about a cave in Mexico that has uh, artifacts going back 30,000 years. Um, I haven't read the whole report. I just saw a bit of an announcement. 
Um, and we've gotten beyond, you know, limiting passage into uh, the Americas via the Bering Strait and to thinking more of uh, rafting and whatnot that some peoples might have, you know, gotten washed out to sea on a raft or a boat and then end up in South America rather than coming, you know, via mm. Bering Straits. And that, that actually makes sense because we have Australian Aborigines going back at least 40,000 years in and uh, probably 60,000 years. They didn't have any sort of land bridge. They had to get there by water. Yeah. Um, so these technologies existed. You know, how sophisticated they were, who knows? You know, whether it was just a raft or a nice boat or uh, uh, QE2, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's definitely one of many, many questions we have yet to figure out. What is, if you could find the answer to one question, just one, what would it be? <laughs> oh, now that's a big challenge. There's so <laughs> many questions out there. Um, right. what, what would it be? I, I think um, the thing that would be most satisfying to me is to find a definitive common ancestor to chimps and humans. Mm -hmm. um, we know from uh, genetics that the divergence took place sometime between five and seven million years ago. We, we've got some, you know, six million year old fossils that might fit the bill. But I, I'd like to go back further. There's there's more of a gap between six million years and. Uh, 13 million years ago when you have Kenyakopus and somewhere in between there is going to be a definitive common ancestor to chimps and humans. That would uh, um, satisfy my career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would satisfy a lot of people and, you know, maybe one day we'll find that out, but I think for now the fossils are going to keep that a secret. Um, so if you had any tips, let's say just top three tips to anthropology students, what would they be? Top three tips to anthropology students. Uh, one, love what you do. Uh, if you're an anthropology student, it's quite a privilege to be an anthropology student. And if, if you're not enjoying it, then get out and do something else. But, but, but love what you do. Um, you know, I, I've had a very fortunate career in that, you know, at 13, I decided to be an anthropologist. And here I am, you know, at age 63. So um, love what you do. What, what other tips would there be? Um, keep at it. Uh, it takes a lot of persistence. So when I was an undergraduate, I uh, told my archaeology professor, you know, I, I think I might switch my major to pre-law because my dad was a lawyer and, and I'm pretty good at arguing things. And, and he said, no, stick with it. He said, uh, if you go through and get your master's and your PhD, there's no guarantee that you will get a job as an anthropologist. Then he said, but if you don't get your master's and your PhD, you're guaranteed to never be an anthropologist. So I, I took that to heart and went off to graduate school at Washington University in St. Louis. That's Sounds like very wise words. I can't come up with a third bit of advice off, off the top of my head. <laughs> oh, no. um, what would you, in terms of how the layman understands human origins, what would you like to see change? Well, the layman understands human evolution. 
Um, what would I like to see change? I, I'd like to see more more openness. A, a lot of uh, anthropologists are, uh, you know, kind of stuck up about you know speaking to the public and whatnot. They just want to teach their courses and do their research and whatnot. But I, I think there must be a lot more outreach to explain human evolution. And so um, my next book, which I'm finishing up right now, uh, is about um, how science in general and faith can work together. Because I, I think that's one of the biggest barriers is you know, people of faith, and, um, they're uncomfortable with the idea of human evolution. I, I, I've said this many times before, I, I think if, uh, if it weren't for human evolution, then the lay person would be totally okay with evolution. You know, whales with the legs are cool and, and snakes with hips and um, dinosaurs with feathers. I think they'd find that really cool. The problem is if those things evolve, then we evolved as well. And that's where people draw the line. Right. So I, I try to uh, spread it out um, from not just human evolution, but to evolution in general, to some of these really cool things. That's but awesome. some, some people are never going to convince, no, no matter what. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I used to debate creationists. My point in doing that was not to try to change anybody's mind because I'm not going to change anybody's mind. But the point in doing it is to give uh, lay people who want to understand evolution more uh, ammunition, so to speak, mm -hmm. and more knowledge in, in how to deal with these questions. Right. Now, um, you said your next book. Um, what are some previous books that you've written? Well, um, I have them right up here, but anyway, uh, uh, there are two editions of a textbook called Understanding Human Evolution. Um, we're thinking about going back and redoing it. We haven't uh, done a new edition of that for, for many, many years, so it's out of date. But my first book, um, it's not a textbook, was called the Riddle Chain, Chance, Coincidence, and Chaos in Human Evolution. And there I, I use my computer modeling skills and whatnot to look at uh, how we evolved and the role of you know, these elusive elements, chance and coincidence, and uh, how uh, chaos plays into it in, in terms of you know, sensitivity to initial conditions. So if we were, to, as Stephen Jay Gould would say, you know, if we were to rewind the tape, would it play out the same way again? Well, no, it wouldn't. There are a lot of, you know, hugely chance things that, that happened along the way. I mean, if that asteroid did not hit uh, off the coast of modern day Mexico and knock out the dinosaurs that remained at the time, we wouldn't be here, Yeah. You know? Exactly. Something else would be here. Well, so the fact I, that okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can you go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, the, the fact that an intelligent being, or semi-intelligent being anyway, <laughs> uh, ha, has evolved is is a, is a matter of chance. Yeah, I I think you know, I was explaining to someone the other day that. Um, you know, evolution really is just the random chance of even just one gene mutating into something else. And it can be so random. And so it's not, um, people don't necessarily adapt over, especially a few thousand years to environmental changes. It takes a little more or a mutation or something that pushes them over the brink. And um, the person who wrote the article was saying the only time we're probably gonna see the next uh, homo is if we somehow get a space colony that is 
separated from Earth for a long period of time. So I I don't see any more um, humans coming around. Where one question, and we'll end with this question. Um, everyone loves this one. Why are we the last one standing? Well, in uh, paleontology in general, there are no why questions. There's only how questions. How, how did it come that we are the last one standing? I mean, obviously other primates are still standing, but uh, I think it's probably because of our great success at adapting to various environments and others could not adapt as well. Um, I myself uh, have 276 Neanderthal markers in my genetic makeup. Um, so I think it was a lot of interbreeding and whatnot as well. And others just couldn't uh, keep up. Um, so the intelligence or the adaptability that comes with intelligence and language, I think language is certainly the key to it all. Um, for a lot of reasons, but that's uh, an entire chapter of my next books. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, that is a whole other video right there. But, but I, I do want to go back. I know that was supposed to be the last question, but you were talking oh, no, about please, the, please. The, the, fu the future of human evolution. Um, I do a lot of this with uh, genetic simulations on my computer. And I really think that we are poised to evolve rapidly right now here on Earth without sending out another mission. Um, I mean, with, with small populations, natural selection doesn't work very well. With 7.8 billion people, there's a lot of genetic variation out there and a lot more than we would have with a smaller population. And you know, it's not going to be something that's going to be visible to us right away. But you know, bit by bit by bit, our species is going to evolve. Now we've seen a little bit of that, just the way humans have adapted to their diets. So you know, just in the last ten thousand years since the origins of agriculture, you know, we have uh, salivary evolution to deal with starches that we have. We have uh, um, lactase persistent to deal with the dairy products that we. Have had, and that, that's all just been in the last 10,000 years. Right, right. So I, I think we're still evolving. It's just, you know, we can't see. And the selective environment keeps on changing. Right. And I mean, would, would a good example of that be um, I was born without my third molars, and so was my partner, and never had wisdom teeth, never needed to get them pulled. Is that a an easy sign of? change that is occurring biologically? Yeah, and that, that is something um, I've also, also written a lot about and wrote about in, in The Riddle Chain, um, is that there is a principle of um, if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. It takes natural selection to maintain features. And as we slowly you know, take over from natural selection, uh, we, we don't need third molars. And if you have a mutation that doesn't give you a third molar, then you know that's easily going to be passed on. So you're the next evolutionary step, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although, so. although, although a genesis of the third molar does go back to Homo erectus, so maybe not. <laughs> oh, well. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well. I want to again thank you so much for coming on. I know a lot of people are going to enjoy hearing your unique perspective and expertise on the subjects that we talk about. And I just, I'm very appreciative that you decided to come on. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I love talking about this stuff. So <laughs> the more, the better. Definitely. All right, well, you have a good rest of your day as I'm going to stop recording. Thank you for adventuring with us into the human past. 
If you've enjoyed this video, check out our website at www.worldofpaleoanthropology.org and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.